the Spirit of God is for every single person, and we're so glad you're here. I want to read a few verses, so let me get started, because I know you're standing. Acts chapter 2, we start in verse 1, and when the day of Pentecost was fully come, today is that Pentecost Sunday that you've been hearing us talk about. They were all with one accord in one place, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire, and it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, or Holy Spirit. That word ghost is an old English word meaning spirit. And began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Verse 5, And there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men out of every nation under heaven. Now when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded because that every man heard them speak in his own language. If you were to read earlier in chapter 1, it would describe where they were all from, Parthians and Medes and Elamites and dwellers of Mesopotamia and Asia and Pontus. It was all these different countries, but they were all gathered in Jerusalem for this feast of Pentecost. And, of course, there were a mixture of Jews and Gentiles. There were also devout Jews, as we just read. Verse 16, Peter now begins to preach as they're wondering what's going on. He says, this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, And your old men shall dream dreams. And on my servants and on my handmaidens I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in heaven above and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. He's quoting from Joel chapter 2. He's referring back to their prophet, Joel, in the Old Testament. Verse 20, the sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and notable day of the Lord come. And it shall come to pass in this culture, in this season, what he has just described as being turmoil and trouble on the earth. It shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Oh, hallelujah. I'm thankful for that promise. Verse 37, now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart, felt the conviction of the Holy Ghost, and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. I want to speak for a few moments on this subject. Salvation made simple. Salvation made simple. Would you bow your heads and pray with me? Lord, we're so thankful to be in your house today. Thankful for the opportunity to go to your word. Thankful for your spirit, your presence that we already feel in this house. I'm thankful, Lord, for brothers and sisters that have joined together today under the banner of the name of Jesus to lift up their voice and to lift up their hearts and to declare your glory and greatness. I pray, God, that now as we open our hearts to the word of God, that you would pour out your spirit in a mighty way, that every single person in this building would be filled with the Holy Ghost speaking in tongues before we leave today. We ask it in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you so much for standing. I know that was a little lengthy. The outpouring of the Holy Ghost that the disciples experienced, what we just read to you here in Acts chapter 2, they, they experienced this shortly after Jesus had ascended up into heaven. And Jesus had told them, even just 
uh, minutes before he ascended up into heaven from Mount Olivet, he, he told them that they were to go to Jerusalem and tarry and to wait for the promise of the Father. It was described as the promise of the Father. They didn't know what that would be or what that would look like. But they just knew that it was a promise and that Jesus had been very intentional about pointing them uh, to this very uh, special place, almost as it were an intersection in the dispensations of time. That now there would be this transition into the church age. That the church, men and women, you and I, would be a part of a supernatural experience. This promise that Jesus gave was a spiritual promise. It was the promise of salvation. A physical manifestation of a spiritual promise. Shortly after the disciples received this experience, it created a stir among the people. This was a festive time, this Feast of Pentecost, and people were there from all over, and they were known to uh, celebrate as uh, we do now with joy and with noise. And, and so the Bible says that as this 120 uh, believers, the inner core, as it were, of the ministry of Jesus that had uh, gone back to Jerusalem from the Mount of Olives where Jesus had ascended and had gathered in this particular room where they were off to meet, they, they begin to pray and they begin to seek God. And, and then as we read in the first part of Acts chapter 2, this, this incredible experience took place. They were filled with the gift of the Holy Ghost. The Bible describes it in some incredible ways that it was like a, a Russian mighty wind. I, I don't know, uh, there were some strong winds here uh, over the last couple of days. Um, we, we heard about, though we were in Cincinnati, we, we heard there were some strong winds. I uh, had an experience a few months ago in uh, Baton Rouge, uh, Louisiana, uh, when a, uh, a tornado came through. Now, we're a little familiar with hurricanes, but... We're not all that familiar with tornadoes down here in Florida, but I heard what I thought was a freight train uh, going down the street. Uh, I was in the hotel and it was overlooked the, the frontage street. And uh, I, I literally, it was, it was at night and I opened up the uh, blinds to see uh, what this incredible noise was. And it was the noise of wind. It sounded like a train. And sure enough, they described that a tornado had, had come through there. There's something about wind that when it comes in that Russian mighty uh, powerful way that it, it creates a noise. They said that. It was like a Russian mighty wind. And then cloven tongues like as a fire that sat upon it. It was all of these physical manifestations of uh, the Spirit of God. This was the essence of God filling up humanity. It was described throughout the ministry of Jesus and then throughout the book of Acts as they begin to see that this was not just a one-time thing. Uh, over in Acts chapter 8, we, we read that they were having a tremendous revival in Samaria. And Philip, who was a young preacher, was the evangelist. And, and he was preaching and they uh, were having many people. They were uh, burning their witchcraft books and they were uh, coming to uh, the knowledge of who Jesus was. And they were repenting and being baptized. And they sent down Peter and, and uh, John and some of the leaders of the church in Jerusalem to, to pray. And when they did, the Bible describes they received the Holy Ghost to the point where Simon the sorcerer, who, who had a thriving business there in that area, in that region, uh, he, he wanted to know how he could buy this power. Oh, my friend, it was not just something that you think about. It was not just something that you heard about. It was something that you could experience for yourself. And it was powerful. It's still powerful. Because he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And then in Acts chapter 10, Peter gets this revelation that this is not just for the Jews, but it's for the Gentiles also. And, and while the Lord's opening up his mind and, and dealing with some of his uh, 
prejudiced thoughts. Uh, there's two uh, servants of Cornelius, who is a Roman centurion, and from Rome, hated by the Jews. A centurion, a leader of at least a uh, 100 Roman soldiers, some of the most cruel, vile people on the face of the earth, the ones that would drive nails into the hands of people that they were crucifying, and, and just all of the, 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 the cruel and unusual punishment that the Roman government would do to keep their subjects in line. And here was Cornelius, who was a leader, a general, a hundred men under him, and he is hungry for God and sends servants that are divinely directed by God to where uh, Peter is getting a little rest and relaxation over there on the little seaside town of Joppa. He's at his friend Simon the Tanner's house. He's resting up on the rooftop trying to take it easy and to recover. But God said, I got a work for you to do. He starts to tell him about this Holy Ghost Spirit that's going to be upon all flesh. And this, then there's a knock at the door. They tell, hey, is there somebody here named Peter? Yes, as a matter of fact, he's on the roof. Well, is it possible we could have a word with him? And they say, we're from the household of Cornelius. He's a Roman centurion. He's been praying. And the Lord directed him in prayer for us to come and to see. And we're asking you to come and to pray for Cornelius and his household. Absolutely, Peter said, I'll be happy to do it. He knew God had been setting him up getting him ready for sometimes the Lord will give you a, a word and give you a revelation and then he's preparing you for the work oh yes he is he's giving you an insight hallelujah that's why when the Lord begins to speak to you you got to know it's not by accident he's preparing you you're going to cross paths with somebody and God's going to give you the word to tell them hallelujah what they must do to be saved and Peter did this, and he went with some of the Jews. They went down there, and as he began to speak and to preach to them about who Jesus was, uh, the Holy Ghost fell on them. I mean, as the word was going forth, the Holy Ghost fell upon them. And he said, can anybody forbid them to be baptized, which have received the Holy Ghost as well as we? What could they say? That whole household was filled with the Holy Ghost. And the Bible said, when they received the Holy Ghost, they spoke in tongues. And then we read about it in Acts 19, as Paul is doing his missionary journeys. And, and he's over in Ephesus, and he runs into some disciples of John the Baptist. And he can tell they're believers, but he asks him, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believe? By this point, there had been a revelation that had spread throughout all of these missionary journeys, throughout all of Jerusalem and Samaria and all of these other countries, uh, that when you received the Holy Ghost, there was a visible evidence of it. You would begin to speak words that you did not know as a visible sign of the Spirit of God taking up residence inside of you. You So what's so special about the Holy Ghost? Because it's the essence of an eternal God that is deposited into these containers of flesh. There's never been anything like it before the outpouring of the Holy Ghost in Acts chapter 2 and there had never been anything like it since. It's the greatest gift known to man. It's God who created you in his image and breathed into you the breath of life but then he breathes upon you again when you receive the essence of eternal God by being spirit filled now millions of people I dare say billions around the world are being spirit filled and we were just uh, recently in Cincinnati as brother Richie was announcing and we begin to see how that when you begin to declare the name of Jesus that you begin to see the atmosphere change this is what the disciples saw in the book of Acts. Uh, this was a festive time, no doubt. This was a time it was noised abroad. But I believe it was more than that that drew people to see what was going on in this upper room. I believe there was a change in the atmosphere. It was just a festive celebration before. It was a time for people to be with their families, and a, a time for people to celebrate because of this 50th day, this Feast of Pentecost. It represented the the jubilee the 50th year whenever if you had debt on your land it was forgiven if you were in debtor's prison you were released there was that 50th year that jubilee and so this 50 days that they celebrated annually it celebrated a time of great festivities because of what it represented a representation of being free 
a jailbreak. <laughs> They're already singing about it today. Woo! Hallelujah. And while they were in Jerusalem for the festivities of Pentecost, God chose the day of Pentecost to pour out his spirit. That's why when someone says that they're Pentecostal, they're saying that they believe in the Holy Ghost experience. Uh, they believe in being spirit-filled. Uh, that's what Pentecost is. He chose the day of Pentecost. When the day of Pentecost was fully come, they'd celebrate many days leading up to it. But when it was fully come, when it was on the day of Pentecost, it was poured out. And that 120, they begin to speak in tongues. And when you receive the Holy Ghost speaking in tongues, it's joy unspeakable and full of glory. You say, oh, I, I don't know. Uh, I've never done that before. I, I don't know what to say. Oh, my friend, all you got to do is begin to worship the Lord. All you got to do is begin to say, Lord, I'm ready to receive your spirit. It doesn't matter what it sounds like. It may sound like baby talk. Uh, you don't have to understand it. Just go with the flow. It's your spirit, hallelujah, that is communicating with the eternal spirit of God. It's other tongues. It's something other than the tongue that you and I know, our native tongue, our English language. And so, as we have seen, uh, there is a change in the atmosphere when the Spirit of God is poured out. Whenever there is a declaration of the name of Jesus, that uh, crusade that we were holding up in Cincinnati this uh, past weekend, we saw uh, something change. We, we started uh, on uh, uh, Thursday night, I believe, and it was indoors, and then Friday night and Saturday night, um, just yesterday and the day before uh, we were outdoors. Well, Friday night uh, we were, where the church is located, we were out kind of like in the parking lot of Grace Point Church and it's kind of up on a hill uh, and it kind of overlooks the city of uh, Cincinnati and uh, we were outdoors and the uh, music team started to sing that song about speaking the name of Jesus over the city. I just want to speak the name of Jesus. Oh, I can feel the Holy Ghost just thinking about it. And they started just singing that over every situation, over the city. And so they began to just sing that song. And you could feel a change in the atmosphere. Oh, my friend, there's something about the name of Jesus. You want to change the atmosphere of your home? You ought to go into every room and declare the name of Jesus. I speak the name of Jesus over my family. I speak the name of Jesus over every room in this house. I speak the name of Jesus in my car. I speak the name of Jesus over my cube at work. I speak the name of Jesus everywhere I go, everywhere we, we put our foot down. Uh, you can speak the name of Jesus and the atmosphere changes. Oh, I've come today to declare to you that it's all in the name of Jesus. There is no other name under heaven. There is no other way. There is no other God. It's all in Jesus. But Friday night as we were up on that hill, I began to exhort the crowd to speak the name of Jesus. I said, we ought to declare the name of Jesus. I want to speak it into this atmosphere. I want to speak into this atmosphere that many people are going to be filled with the Holy Ghost tonight. I said, I want you to speak whatever it is that you want from God. I want you to begin to speak it into the atmosphere. We begin to speak the promises of God. We begin to speak revival over the city of Cincinnati. And the organizer of this crusade had a sister that lived five miles away. She said that she could hear us praying and the singing from five miles away. She said, and, and she described specifically what they were singing, and it was that song about speaking the name of Jesus. And then she began to specifically say what she heard that was being preached, and it was exactly what we were preaching at that very moment. And we said, how did you hear from five miles away? She said, somehow it just carried. You guys were up on the hill. I don't know how it happened, but it carried, and it went from five miles. And she said, we could hear you speaking in tongues from five miles away. But she said that wasn't the most startling thing. She said the thing that really shook us to the point where we all got down and started praying in our homes uh, is that she said we could feel the atmosphere change. She described it as when you can tell 
whenever it's going to rain, you can feel it in the atmosphere. The wind changes, the dew point changes because it's getting ready to rain and the atmosphere fills up with moisture. Oh, I feel that in the Holy Ghost. We're in a time and a season where the atmosphere is changing. He caught the rubble, Woo! The Bible said the latter rain shall be greater than the former rain. There's a change in the atmosphere. God is going to pour out his spirit upon all flesh. And I believe this is what happened on the day of Pentecost. The Bible said it was noised abroad. I like that because it signified a physical manifestation. But I believe the noise revealed a spiritual shift. I said, I believe it revealed a spiritual shift. When you make a joyful noise unto the Lord, the atmosphere changes. This is what worship does. It changes the atmosphere. You can come into the house of the Lord and you can be tired and you can be exhausted, but you begin to say, great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. And the atmosphere changes. You begin to say, Lord, I'm going to just speak your name. I'm going to just declare your glory. I, you may even be a visitor here today and not even sure what all this means, but you just can feel something that you know is God's presence. And you say, I'm going to just go with the flow. I'm going to just believe that God has something special for me. And you can feel the atmosphere. You can have darkness over your life. You can have darkness over your family and your home. And, and you can feel a heaviness. Uh, but oh, my friend, when you begin to declare the glory and the greatness of God, it, it is an atmosphere shift. Uh, and when you begin to worship the Lord, this is why we worship the Lord when we come together and we assemble ourselves together in this place. Because it prepares the environment for the preaching of the word. They begin to worship God. Uh, they were speaking in tongues, but they were worshiping God. Uh, I remember one time uh, in the country of China when we were meeting in underground churches and, and we were seeing hundreds of people being filled with the Holy Ghost. They had to go through a lot of different things to uh, come together, two hour process to make sure they weren't being followed. But when they finally got together and we began to preach about the Holy Ghost and the Holy Ghost begin to be poured out. I, I can remember hearing one lady uh, just, uh, I thought she spoke English because she was speaking without even uh, an accent, but she said the same phrase over and over for an hour. Jesus is God. Jesus is God. Said it in English. And I thought she, she must can speak two languages. And afterwards they were talking to her to see if she could translate. And they said, she doesn't speak a word of English. She can only speak Chinese. But for one hour, she was saying, Jesus is God. Jesus is God. Oh, sometimes when you get the Holy Ghost, you may say, you may say the same phrase over and over and over again. Somebody said, I don't know what they were saying, but they kept saying the same thing over and over and over again. Well, guess what? It's not for our edification. It is the essence of the giver of the gift. Woo, hallelujah. It's a little bit of heaven on earth. When you begin to receive the Spirit of God, there is something that is a part of your human nature that begins to respond to that impulse, that spiritual impulse. We are made up of body, soul, and spirit. We know the body is temporary, but we have an eternal nature in our spirit and soul. And when you receive the Holy Ghost, there's a response of the soul. This is what happened as Peter begins to preach to this crowd that had gathered. He begins to preach. And when he preaches, he refers them to Joel chapter 2. Joel now is this prophet in the Old Testament. He, he knows that there are devout Jews that are in the crowd. And so he says, this is that that was spoken of in the Old Testament by your prophet Joel. Because Joel was a prophetic voice to the nation of Israel. And Peter, sizing up his crowd that he's preaching to, he wants them to know that this is not just something that's come out of left field. This is something that was prophesied by your own prophets. And he begins to quote Joel chapter 2 in Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2 records his sermon. 
but he is referring back to Joel chapter 2 in the prophetic words of this uh, prophet in the Old Testament. And he says that this is that that was spoken of by the prophet Joel. This is what Joel was talking about. This is not something that is new, but your own prophets foretold of this day that the Spirit of God would be poured out. And it shall come to pass, he says in verse 17, In the last days, saith God, I will pour out of my Spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Oh, I'm so glad to know, hallelujah, that this just isn't for the past generation. This is for this generation and the generation to come. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see vision. Your old men shall dream dreams. It doesn't matter if you're young or old. It doesn't matter what your background is. Oh, this Holy Ghost experience is for every single person. And on my servants and on my handmaids, uh, you don't have to be at a certain socioeconomic level. It doesn't matter if you're a servant or a handmaid. It's for everybody. There's nobody that's excluded from the kingdom of God. In those days, I'll pour out of my spirit and they shall prophesy. They shall speak with new tongues. This was the culmination of Joel's message in the second chapter of Joel. Just as it was the culmination of Peter's message in Acts chapter 2. But when you look at Joel chapter 2, you'll find that Joel starts out with repentance. We pick up the narrative in verse 12. Joel says, Therefore also now saith the Lord, Turn ye even to me with all your heart, and with fasting, and with weeping, and with mourning, and rend your heart and not your garments. And turn unto the Lord your God. For he is gracious and merciful. Slow to anger and of great kindness. And repenteth him of the evil. Who knoweth if he will return and repent and leave a blessing behind him. Even a meat offering and a drink offering unto the Lord your God. Blow the trumpet in Zion. Sanctify a fast. Call a solemn assembly. My friend, salvation is as simple as one, two, three. If you can count to three, you can be saved today. The first thing that has to happen is repentance. You have to repent to approach God. And in just a moment, we're all going to repent together. Joel said, come on, Israel, it's time to repent. But I got good news for you. You're serving a gracious God. You're serving a God that's slow to anger. You're serving a God who's kind. But you got to repent. Now, it's interesting because as Peter is quoting Joel, and preaching this message of conviction to the point where the crowd that was there around that upper room said, what must we do to be saved? And Peter says to them, what's the first thing Peter says? Repent. You got to repent. The very thing that Joel said you got to do first is the same thing Peter said many, many, many thousands of years later. You got to repent. Well, here we are now another 2,000 years since the day of Pentecost, and it's still the same first step. You got to repent. There's no way to microwave it. There's no way to uh, somehow sanitize it to where it's comfortable. It just means that you've got to humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. You've got to say, not my will, but thy will be done, oh God. You've got to get on your knees. You've got to get your hands in the air. You've got to open up your mouth and say, God, forgive me of every sin. Yes, yes. Cleanse me. Repentance is not just saying, I'm sorry. Repentance is a turning away from your former path. When they're doing those ROTC drills, you know, the changing of the guard and the military exercise of marching in the honor guard, you will sometimes hear the one who's calling out, Repent! It doesn't mean he's giving an altar call right there. 
when you'll hear them say that, I remember watching them march in front of the, the tomb of the unknown soldier there in, in Arlington National Cemetery on the outskirts of Washington, D.C. And it's, it's done with such dignity, which is amazing. And it's, it's a great experience if, if you're ever there and you can see it because it represents all the people that have given their, their lives, even names that we don't even know. So you and I can have the freedom to assemble together today and to lift up our voices. We do it without fear. What a blessed people we are. And he would say, repent. And when he did, they, whoosh, they would turn and march back the other. When they say repent, it means a full turn. Not a quarter turn. A full turn. They were singing just a few minutes ago about a jailbreak. If you ever are in jail and they set you free, you don't buy a two-bedroom condo right there overlooking the prison you don't say I think I'll just stay right here in the area you get as far away from there as you can who wants to live in Sharps as far as I know Sharps is not growing any that's where the county prison is by the way y'all don't know I'm glad most of y'all didn't know where the jail is it's a good sign. How many of you remember Rayford? Any of you old timers remember Rayford? Yeah, that's the state prison. Not a lot of growth around Rayford either. It's out in the woods. That's where old Sparky used to live. You know old Sparky? That was the electric chair they used to use to execute people. I don't think they're allowed to do it anymore. If somebody's head caught on fire or something when they were electrocuting them. I'm just telling you history, y'all. You're looking at me like I got three heads up here. When people get set free from Rayford, they don't stay in the area. I don't understand why you would say, Lord, forgive me of my sin, and then just make a slight turn and hang around the sin again. Oh, my friend, when you repent, you want to get as far away from sin as you can. That's why God's given you a church family. That's why God's given you brothers and sisters. So you're not alone. you got a place to come together and to draw strength from one another. Repent, 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 repent. Oh, my friend, the Lord has set us free from sin. That's why you got to not even stay in the area. You can't even stay in the vicinity. You got to sometimes say goodbye to some of them old friends and those old haunts and those old places. You got to say, oh, I'm a new creature in Christ Jesus. Repent. I'm going to turn fully from where I used to be. And now I'm walking under the banner of the name of Jesus. I got a new way of thinking. Hallelujah. I got a clear mind. I got an understanding of really what's valuable in life. You know why? Because you have started that three step approach when you repent. Hallelujah. The Bible says that because of Calvary, He will forgive you of every one of your sins. What a great promise that is. You don't have to bring a bull in here you don't have to go and get a sheep you don't have to go and get an oxen and do some sort of a bloody sacrifice the price has already been paid all you got to do is say Lord forgive me of my sins and the Bible says he will forgive you sometimes the hardest part is to forgive yourself but that's step one Peter said it Joel said it Joel then goes to the second step of salvation which is restore you look in Joel chapter 2 and verse 21, it says, Fear not, O land, be glad and rejoice, for the Lord will do great things. Be not afraid, ye beasts of the field, for the pastures of the wilderness do spring, for the tree beareth her fruit. The fig tree and the vine do yield their strength. Be glad then, ye children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God, for he hath given you the former rain moderately. And he will cause to come down for you the rain, the former rain, and the latter rain in the first month. And the floors shall be full of wheat, and the vats shall overflow with wine and oil. 
and I will restore. What a great God we serve. And I will restore to you the years that the locust hath eaten, the canker worm and the caterpillar and the palmer worm, my great army which I sent among you, and ye shall eat in plenty and be satisfied. And praise the name of the Lord your God uh, that hath dealt uh, wondrously with you, uh, and my people shall never be ashamed. Don't forget that word of shame because it's repeated again in the next verse, verse 27. And ye shall know that I am in the midst of Israel and that I am the Lord your God and none else. And my people shall never be ashamed. Notice that this restoration has to do with taking away the shame. Joel was saying to Israel, he's going to restore even the years uh, that you've been wandering uh, and you weren't living right uh, and you weren't worshiping the one true Jehovah God. Uh, God is so good. Uh, he's not only going to take away the stain of sin uh, and the stain of disobedience, uh, but he's going to restore your dignity and your self-esteem uh, and your identity. And he's going to restore the years that have been wasted. Oh, my friend, sin has shame that is associated with it. Baptism is the restoration process in the New Testament church. The second thing that Peter told the group that gathered in the streets of old Jerusalem was that they needed to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Why? For the remission of sins. Remission means removal. Removes the stain. Removes the shame. Baptism is a restoration. It restores your self-worth by removing the stain of sin. That's why sometimes people maybe were baptized as a child but they have gone out and maybe they've had some years away from the Lord. But when they come back, uh, they say, I want to be rebaptized. Uh, even just, uh, I believe it was last week, uh, we baptized a lady. Uh, oh, it was wonderful. She come up out of that water speaking in tongues. Uh, she was baptized when she was much younger. But she said, I want a fresh start. There's something about baptism that is a restoration. Uh, and I've come to tell you today uh, that God uh, is even going to restore the years. You say, oh, pastor, I've wasted too much of my life on riotous living. I've got good news for you. God's going to restore even the years that have been taken from you. He's going to make everything brand new. He's going to make you a new creature in Christ Jesus. By the power of the name of Jesus. Obedience to his word. When you're baptized in the name of Jesus and you go down in that water, you're not just going through some sort of a routine, some sort of a, you know, vain tradition. Oh, no, my friend. You're being baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. And there's a restoration process that begins. The stain of sin, of being ashamed, is washed away. Oh, my. He said, I'm going to restore it all back to you again. Make everything brand new. The first two things are what you and I can do. Repent and be restored. Peter said, you must repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. We can choose to repent today. We can choose to be baptized today. We have heated water back here. We have changing rooms. We have robes. We have big, fluffy, five-star hotel towels back here. It's unbelievable. You should be baptized if for no other reason than just to experience those towels. We've made it so comfortable, it's not even a sacrifice. I've heard stories about they used to chip ice off of lakes and baptize people in freezing water. 
My dad told me one of his first revivals as a young man in the Funiac Springs, they had to put all the car lights down on one of them old springs up there, and there, and there was all kind of snakes that were down there, and uh, they had a fellow that wanted to be baptized, and he said, what do you do? I don't know. I've never been baptized. My dad said, well, the Bible says we're buried with him by baptism in the death, so, you know, just, uh, you know, just when you go down the water, just cross your hands over your chest and just pretend you're a dead man. So he got him down there and all the headlights of that church was down on that spring and he baptized him right there close to the head of that spring and the, the guy was just stiff as a board, had his hands like that. He was trying to be a dead man and when my dad brought him up, the, the, the force of that sp head of that spring just took him right down the spring, just <laughs> right out of the headlights. There was no more head. And they said, that, all right, don't be dead anymore. Come alive. There's snakes down there. That's when he came alive. For long, they could see in the dark, just thrashing all over, trying to come up out of that thing. You don't have to worry about getting baptized in snakes. I mean, you get baptized in clean, chlorine filtered water. It's almost like a jacuzzi. It's got jets and everything in back there. Just give you a snorkel and leave you back there for 30 minutes. It's comfortable. But it's not just getting wet. It's not just going through the motions. I believe with all of my heart. I don't know how many people I've baptized in my lifetime. But I still believe it with all of my heart. Every time I baptize somebody. In the name of Jesus Christ. I see them come up out of that water. They're a new creature in Christ Jesus. They've got a different expression on their face. There's a change in the atmosphere. There's a change in their life. You know why? Because God is a good God. He's a gracious God. He's a merciful God. Oh, I wish somebody would praise him for just a moment. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I got to hurry. The third area of salvation is receive. It's just one, two, three. I'm making it really simple today. Repent, restore, receive. Joel chapter 2 describes it this way. And it shall come to pass afterward that I'll pour out my spirit upon all flesh. When something's being poured out, you don't have to beg for it to fall. All you got to do is get a container and receive it. Ladies and gentlemen, God has already poured out his spirit upon all flesh. I was talking with a man Thursday night that was seeking for the Holy Ghost. And I said, I watched him pray for a little bit and I thought maybe I could help him. And I said, don't think that God chooses. I think I'll fill him and him and him and him and him, her, and him, but not him, not her. I said, that's not how God works. He's poured out his spirit upon all flesh. The only thing that stops it is me. It's the individual. It's not like God says, I like him more than her. No. Receiving the Holy Ghost is not some kind of a lottery. It's poured out among all flesh. I said, you're, you're waiting for the Lord to come down and grab your tongue and shake it all around. And you just stand there as an innocent bystander. I said, that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says they spake in other tongues. As the Spirit gave the utterance. It's your mouth, your tongue. You speak by faith. And the Spirit will give the utterance. He got the Holy Ghost in 30 seconds. And then his friend that was praying went by right next to him. The exact same thing happened to him. You know why? Because you got to get a revelation that receiving the Holy Ghost is just that. It's receiving. That's all it is. I receive the Holy Ghost. Joel said it's poured out. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see vision. And also upon the servants and upon the hand. In those days will I pour out my spirit. 
It's poured out. All you got to do is receive it. When it's raining hard outside, do you ever see anybody out there and they're saying, oh, oh, please let it rain, let it rain. It's raining all over you. Just get a cup or something and fill it up. Fill my cup, Lord. Woo, hallelujah. When you lift your hands, you're saying, Lord, fill this vessel with your spirit. Woo, hallelujah. I feel it in the Holy Ghost. People are going to receive that in just a moment. You don't have to do anything except receive. And it shall come to pass. Now, this is important. Joel talked about this, and then Peter mirrored it in Acts 2. It shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord. You say, how do I receive it? You receive it by using your mouth. I receive your spirit. Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. You begin to use your mouth to praise God, to exalt Him. Oh, my friend, Joel described it as being poured out. The Isaiah, another Old Testament prophet, said, For with stammering lips and another tongue would He speak to His people. But Peter described the third step of this salvation process by saying that, Ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. When somebody gives you a gift, what do you say? Thank you, right? Maybe some of you don't, but it's a good thing to say. Thank you. When you say thank you, you know what you're doing? You're giving them praise. Thank you for this gift. It's an acknowledgement that a gift has been given. Do you know that when you praise God, you are acknowledging that he has given you a gift? Literally, praise is what unwraps the gift. God's already poured it out. I'm just going to say thank you, Lord, for the gift of the Holy Ghost. I'm ready to unwrap that gift now with my praise. Is there anybody in this building that's ready to receive the gift that God has for you? Come on, let's stand to our feet all over this building. Mm. Woo! Mm. Can you feel it in the atmosphere? I wonder now for just a moment, would you lift up your hands and would you lift your voice and would you just begin to praise him and say, thank you, Lord. I thank you for your glory and your greatness. I thank you, Lord, for your goodness. What a great God you are, Lord. You have blessed me. You have kept me, Lord. You've been so good. I just want to say thank you, Lord. I just want to say thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. I thank you for your mercy. I thank you, Lord. You're a gracious God. You're slow to anger, Lord. You're merciful. You've been so good to us, Lord. You have blessed us and you've kept us, God. Here's what I feel in the Holy Ghost. There's anything at all that you want to receive from God. I wonder if you would just step out from where you're standing. Come down this aisle. Find, don't start praying yet. Just gather in. Just stand. The ones that are coming down first, maybe altar workers especially. If you come all the way down to the very front, just get just right up, right up against the altar. If you want to receive anything, it, it may be the Holy Ghost, it may be a healing, it may be a financial, whatever it is you want God, you say, but I'm ready to receive something from the Lord today. I want you to come. There's room for everybody, y'all. We've made these altar areas big where everybody can come down. Just come on down. We'll give you a few moments to get here. Just come down here and stand as close as you can. Woo! Oh, this is beautiful. This is so beautiful. Just gather in from all over. If you can't get down to the front, 
Those of you that are still in the back, you can just come down in the aisles. Just make your way down. Whatever you want. Whatever you want. Come on, you say, I'm going to unwrap that gift right now in the name of Jesus. This is beautiful. In just a moment, we're all going to repent together. But before we do, I want to ask a question. And I want you to let me know by the show of hands. How many of you that are you're down here in this area or maybe you're in one of the aisles and you've never received the gift of the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in tongues. You've never spoke out words that you didn't understand under the unction of His Spirit. Would you raise your hand if you've never received that? All right, thank you. This good brother right here, thank you for your honesty. This sister right here, this sister right here, there's three. Anybody else? Right over here, this good brother is four. Anyone, number five right over there? Thank you. Six. Amen. Anybody else? Don't be afraid. This is awesome. Young people not afraid to raise their hand and say, I want to receive the Holy Ghost. I wonder if there's a way that we could, those of you that raised your hands, if we could just maybe step back a few feet and just let those people come be right down here in the front and just come right there. If you raised your hand, just come right down here in the, in the front because God's got something great for you. This dear sister right here, this wonderful lady, this good brother right here. Anybody else? Marietta, it's so good to see you. I'm so glad you're here. Love you so much. All right, we got everybody here. We missing anybody? you raise your hand you've never received the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in tongues I want to give you an opportunity right here this is Pentecost Sunday right might as well have a Pentecost experience on Pentecost Sunday beautiful now here's what we're gonna do just as we talked about in the message the very first thing we have to do is repent so the very first thing that we're all going to do together is we're going to repent. And when we pray, I want you to just use your own words and just say, Lord, forgive me of every sin. You don't have to get specific, start naming them all. But just say, Lord, forgive me of every sin, everything I've ever thought, anything I, I did, I wasn't obeying your word. I just ask you, Lord, to cleanse my mind, cleanse my hands cleanse everything Lord I believe Lord if I would ask you to forgive me of my sins that you will forgive me and wash me as white as snow by the blood of Calvary you just use your own words and just ask God to forgive you of your sins could we do that now all over this building every single person would you just raise your hands right now come on everybody's got to repent we got to do it every day Paul said I die daily Jesus forgive us Lord of every sin cleanse our heart oh God you understand the frailty of the flesh God oh God we are lost and undone without you we are desperate and hungry for you God cleanse me oh Lord in the name of Jesus Forgive me, Lord. The sins, Lord, of my mind, the sins of my hands, the sins of my feet, Lord. Everything, Lord, that's been displeasing to you, oh God. I'm asking you, Lord, right now to forgive me and cleanse me, oh Lord. I believe that, oh God, by the blood of Calvary, I am free. I believe, God, your word, that if we would pray and ask you to forgive us, Lord, that you would hear our cry, oh God. Cleanse us, oh God, from the top of our head to the sole of our feet. Wash me as white as snow. Yes, in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus.
Hallelujah. Oh, God, we believe you've heard our prayer. We believe you've heard our prayer, oh, God. Oh, God, we believe you've forgiven us of every sin. Lord, we do more than just say we're sorry. We make a commitment, oh, God, that we're going to walk in different direction. We're going to follow after the principles of your word. We're going to live under the obedience, oh God, of your word. Forgive us, oh Lord. Cleanse us, oh God. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. How many of you know that whenever you ask God to forgive you of your sins, He forgives you of every sin. He forgives you of every sin. Now those of you that are Ready to receive the Holy Ghost. Wait just one second. We're going to all pray together. I want to give you some instructions and then you're going to receive the Holy Ghost. Woo! People are already getting their gift. Jesus. Mm. Yes. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Those of you that are down front here that are getting ready to receive the Holy Ghost, let me, let me give you some instructions for just a moment. Then we're all going to pray together again. When you are positioning yourself to receive the Holy Ghost, there's a few things that you can do that will put you in the right mindset so that God can fill you with the Holy Ghost. I'm so glad you're here, brother. Thank you. One of the things that we do is that we lift up our hands. Because when we lift up our hands, it's a sign of surrender. You remember the old days, you know, when you'd play cops and robbers, you'd have a, put your hands up like that, you know, you say, I give. That's like saying, I surrender. Well, when you lift your hands in the spirit, you're saying, Lord, not my will, but thy will be done. I surrender to you. So that's the first thing we do is we put our hands up. The second thing that we do is that we close our eyes. And the reason that we close our eyes is because we don't want to be distracted by anything around us. Because when you receive the Holy Ghost, it's a part literally of you reducing the influence of the flesh and increasing the opportunity for the spirit to connect. You remember I said before, you've got a human spirit, but what God wants to do is give you a Holy Spirit. So to do that, the flesh is always trying to assert itself, and we have to push that back. So when we close our eyes, we're saying, Lord, I want to be able to just focus on you. And I, I believe this with all my heart. When you close your eyes, I want you to see yourself receiving the Holy Ghost, because that helps your faith to begin to believe that it's going to happen right now. I'm not waiting for another service. I'm not waiting for another opportunity. I'm going to receive the Spirit of God right here, Amen. right now. Amen. Amen. The next thing that we do is that we lift our head. Because when you lift your head, you are positioning yourself once again as that container to be filled with the Spirit of God. If you've got your head down like that and you're tucked like, it's hard for the Spirit of God to come into you because you're in a closed position. But when you lift up your head, the Bible said, lift up your heads and look under the hills from whence cometh your help. So that's what we do is that we lift up our head. So we lift up our head, we lift up our hands, we close our eyes, and then this fourth thing that I want you to do is we're just going to pray the prayer of faith here in just a moment, and that is I want you to use your mouth 
And whenever I say hallelujah, you're going to hear it because I'm going to shout it just as loud as this old man can. And when we say hallelujah, I want you to begin to use your voice. And I want you to begin to shout hallelujah as loud as you can. Now, here's why we say hallelujah is the highest praise. It's the one word that's the same in all languages. And it's the highest praise. I want you to shout hallelujah. And then as you shout hallelujah, you're going to feel the Spirit of God come on you. And you begin to speak out whatever you feel. You can't say the wrong thing. Whatever you say, it may sound like mumble jumble, baby talk. Don't worry about it. When a baby starts to learn, he doesn't speak fluid English. The Bible doesn't say how many words you have to speak in tongues to receive the Holy Ghost. It may just be Jesus is God in another language. It may only be three words. But that's the Holy Ghost. And so when you do, you're going to get the joy of the Lord is going to come all over you. And when you feel that, speak it out. Just say it. And when you speak it out, you're going to be, feel a release in your spirit. Yeah. Are you ready to receive it? Amen. How many we got? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Am I missing anybody? We got eight. Bring her on down here. Ooh, this is my dear sister. God's going to fill her with the Holy Ghost. Yeah. See, people are feeling it. It's in the atmosphere. Come on, honey. Don't be afraid. I'm not going to bite you. I won't hurt you none. Just come right down here. This is a good lady right here. Her brother, for many, many years, was a pastor. And I believe God's going to fill her with the Holy Ghost right now. This girl right here, too. All right. That's eight. That's nine. So now, all right, hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. The, the Spirit of God is not fickle. It's, you, can, you can move in the Holy Ghost and you can do it in unity, all right? So those of you that are here, in just a moment, we're going to pray the prayer of faith. And then together... You remember how I told you about in the book of Acts that said they were all in one place? We're all in one place. But now we got to all come together in one accord. And together, the signal is going to be hallelujah. When we shout that out, I want you to begin to lift your voice and to shout hallelujah just as loud as you can. Are you ready? Does everybody understand that? All right, lift up your hands. Lift up your head. Close your eyes. And get ready. Do we have altar workers with everybody? Make sure we got an altar worker with him, her. Here we go. Raise your hands. Raise your head. Now by the authority of the word of God. And by the anointing of the Holy Ghost. And by the power of the name of Jesus. I receive your spirit. Hallelujah! 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 That's it, that's it! You got that! There is freedom, there is freedom. You got that! There is freedom, there is
got the sound of Jesus' name. Lives made whole, hearts away, got the sound of Jesus' name. Say chains will fall, chains will fall, prison shake, got the sound of Jesus' name. Lives 